2023 uh, Christopher N. H. Jenkins Award Lecture. Uh, this is uh, being sponsored by UCSF and the Asian American Research Center on Health, uh, or ARCH. You can get the next slide, please. Just a brief word on ARCH. Uh, we are a collaborative network of researchers um, in academia, clinicians, community leaders, and organizations. Uh, we were created in uh, 2011. Uh, and at this time, we have 26 core individual members, 37 associate individual members, eight core organization members, five associate organization members, um, and numerous interns. Uh, our goal is to create a space for those of us working on Asian American research on health um, to uh, really a place to feel like it's home. And it can be a virtual home. Uh, we don't actually have a physical building, uh, so it has to be virtual. Um, we're happy to have you join us. Uh, we try to not to um, spam you too much. Uh, our emails, I believe, are fairly high quality uh, in terms of uh, job opportunities, grant opportunities, uh, collaboration opportunities, uh, and a newsletter that we uh, put out every couple of months uh, to summarize the current uh, sort of publications on Asian American health um, research. Uh, we'll drop in the chat. Uh, I'm actually, you can go to the uh, 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 the website that you see there, AsianArch.org, uh, to sign on our mailing list. Next slide, please. So just a, a, a word about the, the Jenkins Award. So this is an annual endow award to recognize an individual who has made a significant accomplishment in community-oriented cancer prevention and control efforts working with Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Uh, we uh, usually show a video of Chris uh, Jenkins, who this is named after. Uh, to, this year, we will not. Um, just a few brief words about Chris. Uh, Dr. Steve McPhee and Chris Jenkins founded the Vietnamese Community Health Promotion Project uh, at UCSF in 1986. Uh, it was probably one of the first, if not the first, community academic collaboration uh, interested in conducting uh, certainly Vietnamese American health research, but uh, uh, certainly one of the first working on Asian American health. Um, and Chris and Steve and the project uh, staff conducted some of the very first community-based interventions in cancer control, uh, including uh, cervical and breast cancer screening promotion, and tobacco control and hepatitis B vaccination promotion among Asian Americans in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, during the 1990s, Chris also helped to found the Asian Pacific Islander American Health Forum, uh, the Asian American Network for Cancer Awareness Research and Training, and the Vietnamese Reach for Health Coalition, all of which have had long lasting uh, effect. Uh, and uh, in his honor, uh, when he passed away, um, uh, uh, his friends, colleagues, uh, and family created this uh, top, this award uh, to recognize, as we said, uh, someone who's made significant accomplishments in community-oriented cancer control efforts for our communities. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the list of previous Jenkins Award recipients uh, are here. Uh, they, they read to me at least uh, like a... Uh, roll call of uh, sort of uh, what we could say uh, the originators of Asian American cancer uh, research in this country, uh, including some really important uh, policies, makers, uh, community and patient advocates, uh, uh, academic researchers, uh, and uh, others. Next. Uh, so at this point, I wanted to uh, call uh, Dr. Janet Chu up to as the nominator for Dr. Uh, Scarlett Lynn Gomez to say a few words about uh, her nomination for Dr. Gomez. Thank you, Tung. Um, it is my immense honor and privilege to share a few words about this year's Christopher Jenkins Cancer Control Award recipient, Dr. Scarlett Gomez. Today, we are recognizing Dr. Gomez for her impactful contributions to advancing cancer control efforts particularly in Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander populations. For the past two decades and more, Dr. Gomez's research has advanced our understanding of cancer health disparities and their multi-level drivers. She's effectively leveraged her roles as an epidemiologist, community leader, and researcher to continually advocate for resources to meet the needs 
of our most underserved populations. In Asian American research, we talk a lot about the importance of and many times lack of disaggregated data among our diverse ethnic subgroups. And Dr. Gomez has made significant contributions to improving the systematic collection associated demographic data in healthcare settings and in research in understudied populations. She also developed the California Neighborhoods Data System, which is a compilation of small area level data and social and built environment characteristics. In addition to documenting the unequal burden of cancer in diverse communities, her research has provided critical insights into socioeconomic, cultural, and social and built neighborhood environment factors affecting cancer disparities in detailed population subgroups, including Asian American ethnic populations, and has helped develop more targeted and effective interventions to reduce these disparities. I have witnessed firsthand Dr. Gomez's passion for alleviating the disproportionate cancer burden among diverse populations. She's developed successful partnerships with community organizations in designing and implementing programs to reduce cancer burden, and I've been inspired by the thoughtful way in which she engages with and empowers the communities in which she works. Beyond her remarkable track record of over 250 peer-reviewed publications and dozens of grants, Dr. Gomez has been an exceptional mentor. Her dedication to teaching and mentoring the future generation of scientists and researchers is unparalleled. She selflessly gives of her time and expertise and is truly invested in her mentee's personal and professional growth and success. I personally have been fortunate enough to learn from and work with Dr. Gomez for the past four years, and I'm a better clinician and researcher because of her mentorship. Dr. Scarlett Gomez truly exemplifies the essence of what the Christopher N. H. Jenkins Cancer Control Award represents. Thank you, Dr. Gomez, for your tireless dedication to cancer health disparities research, for your mentorship of the next generation of scientists and advocates, and for your unwavering service for communities disproportionately affected by cancer. For her extraordinary contributions to cancer control efforts in diverse communities, she truly is so deserving of this recognition as a recipient of the 2023 Christopher Jenkins Cancer Control Award. Thanks, Ted. Thank you, Janet. Uh, and I'm sure that we can get many people who will say such glowing things about Dr. Gomez. Uh, I will say a few additional things as we uh, are giving her this award. Um, some of it may be replicative of what uh, Janet, Dr. Chu just said. Uh, Dr. Gomez is a nationally and internationally recognized cancer epidemiologist for all population, not just Asian Americans. Uh, she is professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at UCSF and co-leader of the UCSF Comprehensive Cancer Center's Cancer Control Program. Uh, she has conducted groundbreaking work on the social determinants of health and their relationship to cancer. Uh, as the director of the Greater Bay Area Cancer Registry, uh, she has contributed greatly to the surveillance data on cancer incidents, outcomes, and their patterns for disaggregated ANHPI populations. Uh, this work has been tremendously important as it creates a data that our researchers and communities can use to identify areas for further study and intervention and to monitor progress to improve cancer outcomes for our communities. Um, in addition, she has conducted major studies on key issues such as immigration status, ethnic enclaves, and neighborhood on cancer outcomes. Uh, Dr. Gomez currently study important topics such as explaining why there are high rates of lung cancer among Asian American women who never smoked, uh, disparities in breast cancer prognosis and outcomes among Asian Americans, how to use registries to understand cancer survivor experiences, and how to use technology such as patient portal and, patient and also patient navigation to improve treatment adherence and quality of life among Asian American cancer patients. Um, I am privileged to collaborate with Dr. Gomez on a regular basis through our work in the Cancer Center and through our work with patient navigation. And I can definitely second uh, what uh, Dr. Chu has said in terms of her being an incredible collaborator, team builder, team leader, community engaged researcher and mentor. Uh, please have the next slide, please. This is the uh, part where we try to figure out how to give a uh, hand over the plaque uh, to Dr. Gomez virtually. This is the plaque that we'll be giving to her uh, in person uh, for the award. Uh, it states, uh, uh, this award is for outstanding achievements in cancer epidemiology and cancer control research in Asian American populations and in mentoring Asian American cancer researcher. Thank you, Dr. Gomez Scarlett for everything that you do. Um, congratulations. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much, Janet. That's, you sure know how to make a girl blush. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start my slides. Um, but I 
think before I launch in, I, I wanted to just say a few words. Um, again, thank you, Janet, so much for nominating me and, and for all of your words. Um, and thank you, Tong, and to the Arch leadership for this incredible honor. Um, I unfortunately did not have the pleasure of meeting Chris Jenkins personally, but I certainly have been very familiar and today certainly benefit from his legacy and all the work that he's done among our Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. And I just want to say that every single person that I've met who has known Chris speaks of his kind and nature. And from the picture that Tom put up, you could certainly see it in his um, in his eyes. And I know that this award is meant to be a recognition of my, my group's contributions in the space of cancer control and Asian Americans, but I actually see it as a handing off of the baton from that, that, that roster, that tongue show, that incredible group of prior award recipients. And I, I see it as a handing off of the responsibility to carry on the work um, in this, in this, in this area. This, this is a, a relay race, um, not just against cancer and its impacts on our communities, but also um, a race to dismantle the structures and systems in place that, that reinforce and reify cancer inequities in our Asian American communities. So just sort of where, where did I start in, in this whole journey? Um, like many of us first generation Asian Americans probably here in this virtual room, I was pre-med in college. I found myself drawn to Asian studies and unbeknownst to me throughout my epidemiology training um, in the uh, master's in public health program at Michigan, and then throughout my internship, which led to my job as an epidemiologist at the Northern California Cancer Center, subsequently became the Cancer Prevention Institute at California, it sort of all came together for me. I'd long wondered why there was this pervasive perception of there being a low burden of cancer among Asian American communities when, in fact, we were personally seeing cancer occurring in our families and in our community members. So I knew then, this is sort of where it all clicked, that the tools that we're taught to use in epidemiology could, in fact, be used to address this yet another model minority myth. We could, in fact, use the power of data and how we look at and report the data to dismantle this myth. So that was 25 years ago, as, as um, Janet mentioned. And since then, I've been just so fortunate to be surrounded by and inspired by so many people along the way, many in this virtual room who share this passion. And we've been able to say that we've actually been able to make some meaningful contributions to providing disaggregated data for Asian American ethnic groups and that in turn have helped to show that in fact, cancer is a very real problem in many of our Asian American communities. And these data have helped to inform research aiming to identify, aiming to address these identified problems. It's such a great professional joy to see, to hear somebody who've come up, um, who comes up to me to say that they've used our data to be able to justify and receive funding for a particular project that they're conducting in Asian Americans. And even more meaningful is hearing from patients and community members about how the research has personally affected them and to finally see themselves reflected in the data. So I'm going to talk just a bit today about just a snippet and snapshot of some of the uh, cancer epidemiologic research studies in Asian American populations that we're working on and um, to illustrate how we start with data observations as the scientific rationale for, conduct, for conducting more in-depth studies, but how really at the heart of all these data-heavy epidemiologic research studies are the voices of patients and communities that inspire us in this work. So with that, I'm going to start my talk. Um, just some basic demographic data on Asian Americans in the U.S. So these are data um, from the 2010 and 2020 census. It's comparing changes in the Asian American population over these past 10 years. And in fact, this is the most rapidly increasing racial and ethnic group in the U.S. This population increased by almost 40% over this 10-year period. And you could see shaded by the states that are shaded um, in the darkest um, purple colors are those that have seen the largest increases in growth of this population. This is from the 2020 census data showing the percent of the population uh, across each of the states that's um, identified as Asian American. 
And so many of these are the states that I think we're very well familiar with, Hawaii, um, California, Washington State, some of our East Coast states. But interestingly, you also see that almost across the board, across the U.S., there certainly are groups or states where, with um, increasing representations of Asian Americans. So I think I don't need to um, make this point to this audience because this is, we know this, um, this is a highly, highly heterogeneous population. We have national origins from more than 30 countries, collectively speaking more than 100 different languages. Um, this is, I wanna give a shout out. This is a graphic um, that is yet to be published. You're seeing this for the first time. This is from a paper that uh, Alice Guang, uh, AJ Talignan, Sara Tanjasiri, Alka Kanaya, and myself, um, have currently out in press in the annual reviews of public health in which we reviewed um, a current Asian American cohorts. And so this graphic shows the top six, the six largest Asian American populations you see here in the pie chart, largest being Asian Indians and Chinese comprising each about 23% of the Asian American population. But again, you see the large, the many, and um, uh, an increase uh, sizable populations of other Asian American ethnic groups. And I want to point out here the two or more Asian group, um, which also is a large and actually growing group um, among Asian Americans. There is heterogeneity, not just in where we come from, what languages we speak, but also in our immigration and acculturation patterns. And we see this reflected in our sociodemographic characteristics. So this is uh, the, this is a bar chart showing the percent who speak English uh, less than very well. And you see that it ranges here from um, a high of 64% among Burmese, on nearly 50% among some of our Southeast Asian groups, to um, much lower proportions under 10% among our native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander groups. We also see heterogeneity in other, another metric of percent living in poverty. And uh, this is one of those myths. I think it's commonly thought that Asian Americans are have generally high socioeconomic status, but indeed, when you look at the breakdown in data, there is vast heterogeneity ranging from um, about 4% among Japanese, Filipinos, and Asian Indians who are represented in much greater numbers. And when you look at aggregated statistics, so it's these groups that are driving the, the rosy picture of low, uh, high SES among Asian American populations combined. But at this um, other end, we see, again, many of our Southeast Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander populations having very, very high um, rates of living in poverty. This shows education. So this is a stacked bar graph that shows the distribution of different um, educational attainment levels across the different Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander groups. And without sort of getting into any specific group, you could just see what the different, how stark the differences are. So for example, Again, we see Burmese on, on one end of the spectrum with more than 50% having less than high school diploma. In contrast, uh, here we have, we see Taiwanese on the other end of the spectrum with almost 50% having the highest educational attainment level of graduate or professional degree. And so of course we would expect, we know cancer is driven by established as and also as yet unknown risk factors. And we know that those risk factors in turn are affected by social factors and socioeconomic status, demographic factors such as we see here. So of course we would expect this heterogeneity that we see across our Asian American communities to translate into heterogeneity and cancer risk. Um, here is yet another graph. I, I like this graph despite that sometimes I have to sit and stew on it for a while. So this is showing the distributions of median household income here on the y-axis, along with education, that is percent of adults um, with at least a bachelor's degree. So higher, if as we go out, we have um, higher education, higher proportion with higher education. And then as we go up, we have higher proportion of higher income. And so you see that they generally track, these two metrics generally track. And again, we see the same group sort of falling out across this continuum. Asian Indians on the one end of the spectrum and um, 
Burmese and many of our Southeast Asian and, and Pacific Islander communities on the other end of the spectrum. And I want to note here that we are seeing these extremes of the spectrum. These extremes are also the populations across the entire U.S. population with the highest and lowest incomes. And so we see this play out in terms of their cancer patterns. And with the data that we and many others have been producing over the past 20 or so years, we've been able to show that there are indeed unique and unequal patterns of cancer across the diverse Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander population. In particular, cancer has long been the leading cause of mortality for now over four decades, and we see this in most of the Asian American populations. Um, we also see that they have among the highest incidence in the world for cancers of infectious origin, such as the three examples that you see here. We see a higher incidence of can some cancers relative to other non-Asian populations. Examples are nasopharyngeal carcinoma, lung cancer among nervous smokers, which I'll speak about in a bit more, and thyroid cancer. We also are seeing rapidly increasing incidence trends, such as for breast cancer, which I'll also touch upon in a bit, uterine cancer, and thyroid cancers. And we also know that there continues to be persistently low cancer screening rates among many of these groups. And of course, we, uh, many of these groups experience unique healthcare access barriers. So I want to talk about Two example, three examples of some of our work. Um, the first is focusing on lung cancer. We know that lung cancer is a leading cause of cancer mortality, and we know when we see this among Asian American populations as well. So what this table is showing here is based on vital statistics data, the rank based on age-adjusted mortality rates and the percent of all cancer deaths of the top five cancer sites for males in this top panel and for females in this bottom panel. Among, across all of these Asian American ethnic groups shown here, lung cancer is the top contributor to mortality, comprising nearly up to a third of all deaths due to cancer. So I think we're not so surprised about that. What is surprising with these statistics is what we see here on the bottom panel, that lung cancer also ranks among the top. Um, in the case of Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese, it is the number one cause of cancer-related mortality. What's surprising here is that we also know from population level risk factor data that smoking prevalence is exceedingly low among these Asian American female populations. And so we sought out to try to address this question. Um, unfortunately, we don't have good smoking data in cancer registry data. Cancer registry data are the, the mainstay of the source of cancer statistics that we see um, reported um, in all of our national reports, but we don't have good smoking data in, in those data sets. So, so we had to think creatively, how are we, how are we going to actually document if cancer rate, lung cancer rates are actually higher or not among Asian American female populations who've never smoked? So we used an approach, this is uh, through research funded through the NCI, in which we integrated electronic health records data, cancer registry data, as well as geospatial data to try to study this question. So this is a study funded by um, my colleague in our lab, Iona Chang and myself. Um, and we, what we did was our approach was we took EHR data or electronic health records data from two different healthcare systems, um, Sutter Health, which covers about a third of the Northern California population and Kaiser Permanente Hawaii, which size-wise is much smaller, but has a very large um, proportion and robust numbers of Asian American groups. And what's noteworthy about these two data sets is that they have um, detailed capture of specific Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander ethnicity, including capture of multiple race, um, as well as detailed capture of smoking status. So what we did was we merged the EHR data from these two systems. We combined them into, into a longitudinal cohort, which we were able to observe over time through linkage to cancer registry data to identify risk of lung cancer, subsequent risk of lung cancer. We extracted EHR data elements for um, sociodemographic factors as well as known and suspected risk factors of lung cancer. We harmonized across the two systems. Um, through geocoding, we were able to assign area level and environmental data that you see here. And as I mentioned, we linked to cancer registries from the two states. 
Um, our initial linkage identified a total of over 7,000 lung cancer cases within this cohort of over 2.2 million individuals from the two healthcare systems, of which about 3,800 were, were females. So this is the distribution of smoking status, never ever, but and also missing smoking status um, among females diagnosed with lung cancer across these two EHR-based data systems. Um, what I'm showing you here are the distributions for detailed Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander ethnic groups. And for comparison purposes, I'm also showing you the distributions for non-Hispanic, white, black and Hispanic populations. Um, so we see for NHPIs combined, a 15% of females diagnosed with lung cancer did not, were never smokers, um, about 50% among all Asian Americans combined, and this is compared to 21% among non-Hispanic whites. But focusing on the highest and lowest, um, we see among Native Hawaiian, other Pacific Islanders, 14 to 20% were never smokers. And 79% of Chinese females diagnosed with lung cancer are, were never smokers. And so I just want to kind of pause and, and let the statistics sink in. Um, so among Chinese American females diagnosed with lung cancer, these are women with lung cancer, nearly 80% have not smoked. And of course, all of these cases here are not eligible for screening, according to current screening guidelines. And so one might wonder, well, maybe we're just seeing such high proportions of nervous smokers among Asian American females because there's just a lot of them in the general population. So of course that's who is diagnosed. So, but what we really need to know are what the incidence rates are um, among these populations. And so because of the study design, we were able to calculate cancer incidence rates. And so what we did see in fact was that these are the rates of lung cancer. So I want to just kind of focus you in on the rate of lung cancer. These are among never smoker Asian American females. The rate was 10 per 100,000 persons among non-Hispanic white females. And for every, almost every Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander group, we saw higher incidence rates. Um, with the interesting exception of Japanese Americans, but this seems to be a pattern that's really playing out across a lot of our studies um, across a number of different cancer sites. But so this actually translated into a higher, about a 1.5 to two-fold higher rates of lung cancer among Asian Americans compared to non-Hispanic whites. Um, and so this is all among female never smokers. So the question is why? We can only really sort of do so much in terms of looking at what the contributing factors are to this disparity um, with using EHR data. So my colleagues, Moon Chen from UC Davis, Iona Chang from UCSF, and myself, uh, we proposed and were funded on an R01 funded through an IMHD um, to, on a study to elucidate lung cancer etiology among Asian American females who've never smoked. We call this the FANS study. The goals of our FAN study are two broad goals. First is to identify the attributable risk of known putative and suspected multi-level risk factors for lung cancer among Asian American females who've never smoked. And in particular, we're interested in focusing on genetics, uh, different individual level exposures, especially those that may be culturally um, specific and unique to these populations as well as contextual level risk factors, including social environmental factors, as well as indoor and outdoor ambient air pollution. And then our colleagues at UC Davis will be leading an aim to look at the, to characterize the mutational landscape, um, so mutational profiles of the lung cancer uh, tumors among these Asian American females who've never smoked and identify their associations with the multi-level risk factors. We are actively recruiting for the FAN study um, from multiple counties in North, uh, Northern and Southern California, as well as in Sacramento. And so if you have, if you're interested, I would um, encourage you to see if, you know, to, to help us to promote recruitment for the study by getting the word out. And you could scan the QR code here on this slide, which will link you to our website. But the website is also pasted here above. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, and, and, the, and the title of this talk is about data plus community. Um, 
And as I mentioned at the outset, it's, it's really the patients and the communities that inspire us and, and motivate us and drive us in, in this research. And so I, I, want to I wanted to include here a quote um, from Dr. Trish Holm, who was a patient advocate, um, a member of our community advisory board and, and, and a part of our research team. So Trish came to us as she was recovering from, from her lung cancer treatments, um, really wanting, having the passion of really wanting to do something and, and to make sure that her personal lived experience can, can translate into something meaningful. Um, I just put here a quote from, that, from an interview with her um, in the magazine Cancer Health um, two years ago. So she wrote, three years into my diagnosis with the help of two season lung cancer patients, I started to wake up and look more closely at my life. I remember the old me, brave, strong, and determined. And rebuilding myself, I joined, she joined Arch. Um, and um, she was referred to me, um, and I won't say here what she says about me. And so she's, um, at the time, um, she says, I am now a research associate for the FAMS study. The truth is there are minimal data on this important healthcare issue. FANS is looking at possible risk factors and exposures that are distinct to lung cancer patients in the Asian American population. We are literally dying to find out why Asian American women who never smoked tobacco are being disproportionately diagnosed with lung cancer. The FANS study with me on board is on it. And unfortunately, uh, Trish died, passed away um, last year. And so shifting focus now to lung cancer, um, why do we care about lung cancer in Asian American women? So this is an old uh, graph uh, that was that came from a publication from 2017. And the reason I wanted to show, we don't, as epidemiologists and cancer surveillance people, we don't typically like to show data data, but, but I'm trying to make a point here. So these data points go up to 2013. We don't have any data beyond 2013. And the reason for that is because the census does not count, completely enumerates a detailed Asian American ethnic groups between census years. They only do it every 10 years. Um, and so without that data of the population that measure that counts our population at risk, we're not able to continue the surveillance until we get the next decennial census data, um, which just came out in 2020. So we're sort of stuck here. We certainly are capturing this data at the numerator level within our cancer registry data, but without that denominator data that comes from the census, we're just stuck. But what do we see here? We see that every ethnic group, we see a statistically significant increasing trend in breast cancer. Um, again, with the interesting exception of Japanese, but, um, but you see this upward trend in every ethnic group. This very top line is a trend graph for non-Hispanic white women, and, and it's been generally flat um, for the past uh, 20 or so years. We did another interesting study. Um, this was based on a pilot case control study called the Asian Cheese Study. And um, Dr. Brittany Mori, who is now at UC Irvine, and Dr. Gil G um, from UCLA, we collaborated on this analysis. And what we showed was potentially a reversal of breast cancer risk factors when we look at compare US born to foreign born. So I wanna just kind of walk you through this table a little bit. This first column with these odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals are minimally adjusted. So they're just adjusting for the matching factors of the frequencies of age and Asian American ethnicity. The second column, the second set of odds ratios are adjusted for known breast cancer risk factors. And so what we were interested in doing was to see what was the risk of, um, what's, the, what's the difference? So what's the relative odds of breast cancer risk when you compare foreign born to US born? And we saw that risk was actually higher among foreign born compared to US born. And no matter which way we cut it, whether we looked at foreign born who've spent less 50% or more of their life in the US compared to less foreign born based on what year, what age they immigrated at, foreign born based on how long they've lived in the US, we saw this increased risk. So initially, of course, I, this was Brittany's um, dissertation. I thought, no, 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 we must have coded this wrong. This is not what we understand of breast cancer risk. What we understand, a traditional understanding is that 
you know, in Asia, you start out having low risk, you come to the U.S., and with subsequent generations, your risk increases as you become more acculturated and you adopt all these different risk factors associated with increased breast cancer risk. So, so this can't be right. Check your coding. She did. And, and, and this is what we see. And so we, we published this and, and our, and we, and we attempted to understand this pattern because this is the first time we've ever seen this. So I think if, if you think about it, the Asian cheese study took place in the, in the Bay area. And at the time that we recruited, which was in the um, mid-20, about 2015, 2017, 2018, this was when we were seeing the tech boom. All, all these immigrants have been coming from Asia. They were recruited here. They came here for specific um, purposes to seek a better life, but they already were highly educated, generally higher SES. And in fact, there are publications that also have been coming out at the same time showing that the rates of breast cancer in East Asian countries, um, and I've heard recently also, as well as in South Asia, have been increasing at, at, at the most rapid clip at such a point that it's projected that there, the rates of breast cancer in Asia are going to be among the highest in the world. So if those are the people who are coming here and coming here in a way that they can afford to live in the Bay Area, um, they're a very different type of immigrants compared to the you know, immigrants um, from, for example, my parents' generation. Um, so potentially they're already coming here. These foreign-born are coming here with already established breast cancer risk factors. And so this kind of makes sense if you consider all of that sort of historical societal um, context. Um, but this was a small pilot study. You could see that the confidence intervals were big and certainly needs replication. So this uh, paper was picked up by a number of uh, news outlets. Um, Mercury News wrote about it, and then the same article appeared in multiple national newsletters, including the Chicago Tribune. And this was one of the quotes from um, that article. When Margaret Abikoga was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2015, she was as surprised as anyone. After all, no one had breast cancer in her Japanese American family. She doesn't have the genetic marker, and she'd been led to believe that Asian Americans um, as Abe Koga put it, a, a high propensity um, a high propensity group. We're not a high propensity group for this disease. The results from the study stunned Abe Koga, age 46. For generations, she said Asian Americans have been under the wrong impression that breast cancer is not prevalent in our community. So it's not something that people think about. So this was somebody who was interviewed in this newspaper, but actually um I regularly receive emails and notes from people in the community with very similar testimonials. So they're not, we're not reporting the data and the data that are being reported based on all of us aggregated together, again, is painting this rosy picture. Well, since then, just a couple months ago, the, these results were replicated. Um, so this was a paper that came out just a couple of months ago in CEBP from um, our colleagues, Esther John from Stanford. So she, um, I was not involved in this study at all. And she told me when it was about to come out, she said, you know, Scarlett, I saw your paper. I was really surprised by it. I was kind of skeptical of it. And I thought, hey, I have the data set. I can look to see if we're seeing the same patterns in our studies. So she saw the same pattern. So what does she do? She compared also foreign born to US born, but because her study was much larger, she was able to look at two separate birth cohorts, an older birth cohort and a more and a younger birth cohort. And what she saw was that there was that this elevator risk of breast cancer among foreign born compared to US born was actually stronger among the younger birth cohorts. She then, like us, cut her data a number of different ways. So she looked at it among Chinese comparing foreign born to US born and saw almost a two, uh, more than a twofold higher risk in this more recent birth cohort. Among Filipinas, same thing. And then she also looked at it among all the Asians in her, in her study, but by uh, language of interview and um, saw also that, and saw interestingly that those who speak Chinese um, for their interview actually had almost a fourfold higher risk. 
And I want to note, even though it's in small print here in the footnotes, that these odds ratios are adjusted for a number, for all of the established breast cancer risk factors. So this is given what we know about breast about um, uh, breast cancer. There's still this excess risk. So there's something else going on. It's not just simply because these are already women who already have all the known breast cancer risk factors. So there's there is something else going on. Um, this is an, another graph. This comes from our annual report that our registry puts out. So this is now, again, we were not able to look at data for Asian Americans disaggregated because of denominator issues. Um, so this is looking at all Asian Americans combined. So probably the only time I'm going to show you aggregated statistics. So this is, again, all ages across California by race for all Asian Americans combined. And you see this blue line, the steadily increasing line. This is about a 4% increase in incidence trends over time for Asian Americans. Um, we also see a slight increase for Hispanics, but generally flat trends for um, non-Hispanic white and black um, women. But look at the, the younger age group, the premenopausal or less than 50 age group. And look at this blue line. It's steadily increasing to such a point that at the latest time point, the, the, um, which is 2019 in these data, the rate of breast cancer among young Asian American women is the highest of all these other racial and ethnic groups. Um, and I'll also note that a question was asked um, whether this is just due to screening. Are we just picking up now on screening? And so these are all early stage breast cancer. So we've also looked at this by stage and the rates are indeed going up across all stages of disease. And in fact, the highest percentage increase is seen among distant stage disease. So this sort of led us to ask whether there are distinct breast cancer, if this perhaps there are dis if, if there are distinct um, differences in what we see in breast cancer among Asian Americans compared to other ethnic groups. Um, from some prior research in collaboration with um, Stanford um, clinical colleagues, we found that there are more HER2 new tumors. This has since also been replicated by studies in Asia. There are also distinct age-specific incidence curves, this, which we found that, that the rates are as high as, if not higher, um, the non-Hispanic white women um, in premenopausal age, as you saw in the prior slide. Um, and then, but interestingly, rather than continuing to go up, the rates, um, breast cancer rates stay flat or actually decline postmenopausally. Um, we also see, as I mentioned, um, increasing rates of distant stage disease. And so in an earlier, that earlier publication, we looked at um, rates by stage and saw that the distant rate stage disease was increasing at a rate of 2% per year among Filipinas. So this led us to um, uh, let, write this editorial, um, my colleagues and I, of to ask whether breast cancer in Asian and Asian American women um, is in fact a different disease with a whole different set of risk factors. And so with that, we were motivated to um, start a new study. This is actually a program um, with the goal of understanding breast cancer risk in Asian American women. We call this the CRANE study. Again, we are actively recruiting. I have to give a plug out. We're recruiting um, cases and controls um, from Northern and Southern California, specific LA, specifically LA County um, in collaboration with USC. The QR code takes you to our website. You can... Um, register to participate in the study. Um, and it's uh, we are collecting epidemiologic data as well as some vital specimens, um, as well as environmental data. And really the focus uh, in this first space is on experiences with discrimination and stress. And this is funded by the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Um, this line of research is really motivated by many, many within my own family, um, many colleagues, and just brave advocate voices out there um, who are, have experienced breast cancer. Uh, Susan Shinagawa, who is a prior recipient of the Chris Jenkins Award, um, emailed me, actually. So this came from her email, and, and I have certainly known of her prior to receiving her email, and I've kept the email. So she wrote in her email, I think many of us are familiar with Susan's story. My 1991 diagnosis was only obtained after I saw a second opinion following a surgical oncologist's refusal to biopsy a very prominent and palpable breast lump. 
The reasons he refused to perform the biopsy was because I was, quote, too young to have breast cancer, had, quote, no family history of cancer, and, quote, besides, Asian women don't get breast cancer. I believe the latter statement was made because of his familiarity with NCI SEER cancer data for, quote, API <laughs> aggregated populations, which, as you are well aware, were then and continue to be reported in the aggregates. I have that surgeon to thank me for turning me into a fierce cancer advocate. Okay, so the, the third area of research I want to um, talk about is our work on neighborhoods. Why do we care about neighborhoods? Because I think the traditional paradigm of cancer research focuses on this part of the link between individual level health behaviors and cancer health outcomes. But this is actually, this, this, this part of the association is actually situated within a much larger continuum of influences on cancers. These are just the downstream impacts. In fact, we want to start to move upstream. We should start moving upstream. And so we, our lab has been doing a lot of work trying to focus on these upstream factors, these structural determinants of health, institutional and social inequities, as well as these social determinants of health, the, the conditions within which we live, play, work, and, and work every day. So specific to Asian American um, populations, and I have to thank my colleague in my lab, Dr. Salma Sharif Marco for this, I stole this graph from her. Um, we've been really interested in this idea of ethnic enclaves. Um, and so I led a study, a small pilot study long ago in which we thought, you know, we've been using census data to try to come up with a way to characterize socioeconomic status within neighborhoods. Why can't we do the same thing to characterize ethnic enclaves? So what are ethnic enclaves? These are ethnically, culturally distinct neighborhoods that comprise high concentrations of individuals of the same ethnic origin with high linguistic isolation and a large share of recent immigrants. And they also potentially can have many um, high proportion of ethnic businesses and resources. And these are the different mechanisms by which ethnic enclaves may impact upon health outcomes through having strong social networks and cultural cohesion, but also through experiences with discrimination, but potentially also buffering against that discrimination by providing in language culturally tailored resources. Um, they may have the more environmental pollutants. They also do tend to have, uh, tend to be of lower uh, SES and they may have um, access to distinct food resources. So we've our group, and now um, this is work that's really led by Salma, and this is through an R1 that she co-leads with Sandy Pruitt from um, UT Southwestern called the Enclave Study. So we've really been trying to do methodologic work to advance our ability to look at, to measure ethnic enclaves, and then consequently how they relate to health, cancer health outcomes. So these are the aims um, from Salma's study. Um, and I think what's really notable about this, um, this work, and this is funded through NCI, is that it's, it's the breadth of the coverage of this research, that it's focused on five states with large populations of Asian Americans and Hispanics is, is another focus of, of this project. And so this is just a graph. Um, Again, I stole this from Salma, thanks Salma, that shows um, a, a map that shows the distribution, um, spatial distributions of Asian American ethnic enclaves according to 20, 2010 Census and American Community Survey data. So this is for California and you could see it's um, sort of order so that the darker shades are the more um, um, ethnically distinct neighborhoods. Um, this uh, within the study, we are also able to look at um, um, pop, um, neighborhoods that have high concentrations of specific Asian American ethnic groups. And so this is the Bay Area. And you, I thought this was really striking because you could see very clearly the sort of, um, and we kind of know this, many of us who've lived in the Bay Area for a long time, we know that the Vallejo area and the, and the Daly City area have a lot of um, Filipinos um, where I am right now today in Fremont, we have a lot of Asian Indians. Um, this is, you know, San Jose, we see a lot of Vietnamese. And then uh, San Francisco, we see a lot of Chinese. So this is just another way to look at um, ethnically distinct neighborhoods. And here is one example of an article that came out of that study, and this is led by um, Alice Guang, who is a PhD student, um, an amazing PhD student in our program. 
So what she did was she characterized neighborhoods across these five states on the basis of ethnic enclaves and looked at their association with uh, healthcare accessibility, as well as a number of different um, area level um, social determinants of health variables. But what was really, I think, innovative about the way that this was done was that she, we characterize ethnic enclaves in four different ways that try to capture the dynamic change over time. So these four ways are comparing data from 2000 to 2010. We captured whether um, an area was an enclave in 2000, but not in 2010. So these are former enclaves whether an area has never been an ethnic enclave, these are never enclaves, whether an area has been an ethnic enclave in both decennial time periods, so these are persistent ethnic enclaves, and then whether an area um, was, an, was not an enclave in the earlier time period, but it became an enclave later on, so these are emerging enclaves. Um, and these are just some selected metro areas from each of the five states. And you definitely can see the distinction between the four different typologies of enclave trajectories playing out and, and how they're sort of, you can sort of distinguish neighborhoods on the basis of these trajectories. And I think what was, I pulled out one of the tables in here so you could sort of see how the data play out um, across these four different enclaves. So these are the four different types of enclave trajectories. And um, you could see, for example, the percent poverty was actually highest in the former enclaves and lowest in emerging enclaves. And similar pattern we see for percent uninsured, where it was the highest, almost 18% in former enclaves um, and lowest in the emerging enclaves. So this um, research really shows us that in addition to just characterizing whether an area is an enclave or not, currently that it may be instructive to also consider how that neighborhood has changed over time. Okay, so I just wanna end here by really sort of shifting our focus. We've sort of started to shift upwards and you, you see in some of the um, research that I have been, examples of the research that I presented that our, our group is doing that all of them, all of that research has a focus on neighborhood factors, social determinants of health and structural factors. Um, so this really is a key focus of our research, trying to bridge these factors from cells to society. Um, it's critically important, and I, I firmly believe that we need all of this. So that data, but plus the community aspect here is really essential in being able to mitigate inequities of cancer in Asian American populations. And so I want to put forth a call in action. I know those who are in this virtual room and, and from my group are like, oh, there's Scarlett goes again with her calls to action. But but I, I feel really passionate about this. And, and since I have this, Arch was kind enough to give me this forum, I want to put this forth to all of you. So I my call to action to everybody is that we need to continue to recognize heterogeneity within our populations and aim to disaggregate. And this means advocating for data justice. Um, we need to do a critical assessment of this, you know, our sort of gut reaction, knee-jerk reaction, performa practice of always comparing to white data. We need to focus on the impact of historical trauma and lived experiences, and the impact of upstream structural and social drivers, including structural racism and discrimination. And I think we also, it's really important, and, and we have a responsibility within those of us as epidemiologists to examine intersectionality, the, um, uh, the, the, what does it mean to, to identify not only as a, in my case, Taiwanese American, but also as a female, as somebody who lives in a certain type of neighborhood, um, and to consider our sexual orientation and gender identities within that as well. And of course, we need to continue to make sure that we are attentive to language and cultural needs so that we are maximizing inclusive inclusivity. Um, this was a commentary that um, a number of us participated in. It was led by, um, at the time, med student, um, Christy. Um, this was published in CEBP, CEBP, and it was speaking to the um, increase in violence um, that we had been observing during the COVID era and really um, uh, 
encouraging cancer researchers to pay attention to, to these phenomena. Okay, so I think you've all seen the, that meme, the social inner, the internet meme of how it started, how it's going. So, so there's me on the left, um, I'm, I'm the girl, that's my little brother and that's my mom. And then that's how we started. And this, that was our neighborhood in Taiwan. And how it's going is that I'm here today speaking to all of you and, and accepting this award, which is just such an incredible honor, but it's really an award. It's not a, an award for, for just one single person. Um, it's really an award for all of us. Um, and specifically in, in my case for my lab, the Dream Lab, um, and also my registry that I've had the honor of being involved in over the past 25 years. And so these are all the people in my lab. Um, and I want to, of course, acknowledge so many other colleagues and mentors and mentees that I've had the fortune of working with um, all these years. Thank you so much.